we go. Hey guys, it's Fernando from Seller Tradecraft. I'm here with Anthony. Sorry we're a little bit late. We had some technical difficulties, but yeah, I'm super excited. We're, it's uh, Monday, but yeah, we're going to be talking a lot about scaling today. Yeah, I mean, this is one that I like really, like one of the topics that I really love. I don't think a lot of other kind of Amazon sellers talk about it because like from what I've seen, like a majority of Amazon sellers are kind of like these like one man or two people like kind of shops, which I think is totally fine. But, you know, a lot of people want to find out, like, you know, how do you get to seven figures or how do you eventually get to eight figures? And truthfully, I think getting to that kind of eight figure mark, you need like a team behind you. And then so how do you like really scale like your teams, your process, your systems so that you're able to get to that size and not like lose all of your hair or like just like honestly go insane because there's just a lot of moving pieces. And so, yeah, I'm like, I'm super excited. We're going to be talking about it with like Anthony and then just kind of how we went about it. And hopefully there'll be a lot of like actionable insight that you guys can take. If you're just starting out, I mean, truthfully, like you can listen in, like it's going to be probably like a little bit uh, more advanced, but like, I mean, it's still, you know, something really like that's great to kind of aim towards and think about as you're like building your business so that you're kind of setting yourself up for like success. Sure. And then, so I just shared it to the group and everything, but yeah, in terms of just scaling to the eight figure levels, it's maybe you're not there at that mark yet, but it's good to know like the pathway to get there, right? It's good to understand what the roadmap is, what the hurdles you might expect along the way to scaling to eight figures, to building out your team, to managing your team and just, you know, what your next hires could be. Right. So I guess just to like start off Fernando, I'm like, I would ask like, do you know, like, did you think you were going to get to, I th- how many employees do you have now? I guess. Uh, we're probably like around like 31 now. It's kind of crazy. Yes. I mean, give or take like that. 31 employees. All right. So for those of you guys watching right now, how many, comment uh, right now with like how many employees you guys have. All right. I'm just curious to see like how many employees that you guys have. If you guys have VAs, local hires or so, but for now, like, fact that you have like about 30 employees now like did you ever think you were going to get to this point when you started your amazon journey or no way that? yeah i mean honestly i remember like really early on telling like nick i didn't want to go over 12 employees and like so, <laughs> yeah so almost three times that uh yeah i mean i like i think you know coming into this you know it helped like run like a previous startup and like to me, like the most fun time I think was like when we were like between like five and 12 employees. Cause like, you know, below, f- like below five, you're kind of like always kind of like arguing a little bit. Cause you have really no idea what you're doing and you're kind of, you're kind of figuring everything out. So there's like a lot of like growing pains. And I thought five to 12 was just really fun in terms of like things being insane, kind of like a little bit more like depart- uh, departmentalized, I guess you would say. And yeah, like things were like moving really fast. Um, but I can definitely say like uh, now at 30 employees, like I'm having way more fun than I ever thought I would be. And like, and more fun than <laughs> when we were between five and 12, uh, just because we have, like the ability to take on new projects and execute them. And like, I can have so little involvement. And I think that is like the power of like building like really great, like, um, like kind of highly functional teams. Uh, and I think that is like super rewarding where like, you know, we can give some, like, like two people, like a project, they kind of like tag team it. They show us like, they show up in like, like we, you know, in a few weeks with it completely completed, you know, better than we could have ever thought. And like, we had like nothing to do with it. And I think that's really cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, David, cha-cha, sorry, my camera's super blurry. I guess I just have either slow internet connection or my MacBook is the old version compared to Fernando's. (laughs) But (laughs) yeah, but yeah, no, that's really interesting. Like the fact that you say having 30 employees is having more fun than when you had like five or 12, like, because I'm not even at the point where I have 12 employees and uh, those are there's a whole bunch of people that just joined a uh, quick question for you guys do you guys currently have vas right uh comment below if you guys have vas and if so how many do you have like how many people are on your team i'm just curious because uh we're trying to figure out like who, who's an audience and where you guys are trying to get to right so like fernando and nick like they have 30 people now if you guys didn't hear and like that's a lot of people who manage right so like off the bat like is there a way that you guys stay organized in terms of like 
project management tools? Like what can other people like use to stay organized? Even even if their team is just themselves, like when they're starting out, like what tools are there out there for people? Yeah. Um, so yeah, as you're starting to kind of build out your teams, for sure we use Slack. Um, and Slack is really cool because it's free up to like a certain amount of like people, I think. And then like, you know, they have different pricing based on like how much search history you have and all that kind of stuff. But that's definitely one of the best tools. Uh, they have a really like easy to use mobile app which is really nice. And then it's kind of easy to kind of put on do not disturb mode and, and then not think about work like on the weekends or, you know, if you're with your girlfriend or whatever <laughs> on vacation. So, yeah, I mean, I would say like Slack is definitely one of the best tools for communication. And then, so we have it built out kind of by departments so we can message people directly, but we also have like team channels. So like, you know, our marketplaces team have their own channel and then like our support team has their own channel. And then, so you're not seeing like all these like notifications. And I think the biggest like uh, thing, like for those that don't use Slack is that it reduces the amount of emails. And I feel like in the past, like before, like, you know, tools like Slack, uh, people were constantly sending you like updates via email. And so you would like had this like kind of overload of emails and then you just like, you know, you have 50, you know, a thousand unread messages and you just never get through to the important ones. So now like with Slack, almost all of our internal communication is done through that and another tool called flow that I'll talk about. But yeah, so like email is almost like reserved for external stuff, which is really cool because then like pretty much all the external stuff that we're getting is really important, right? It might be something from a supplier or it might be something like from a wholesale client or whatever it may be. Or like, sorry, like our retail kind of stuff. And then that is like, you know, what, what we really pay attention to. But then, yeah, we use Flow. We just switched from Asana uh, maybe about a month ago. So, you know, part of scaling is that we had our HR person actually like her first project um, was coming in and then figuring out what our new uh, task management software was going to be. None of us really loved Asana. We'd never like really fully got to like using it for everything. And like I wanted mm -hmm. something. That would be better integrated. So we found Flow. It has like um, is Flow spelled like F L O W. Yeah, so okay, it's getflow.com. Cool. And then so yeah, actually we need to implement it for solid tradecraft. But yeah, it's on the two list. <laughs> but yeah, it's really sweet. Like it has Kanban functionality, uh, which I know Asana has. So like if you guys have never seen it, like I guess you would start like okay, so it'd be over here. Yeah. So you, yeah, so you'd have like kind of your um, things to be like assigned here, maybe like a backlog. And then you have uh -huh. like, you know, the kind of the stuff that's maybe been assigned, stuff that's like in progress over here and then like kind of finished over here. And then so basically you have all these little tiles and then they're moving from like this like left side all the way to the right side. I don't know if that really makes sense. Um, but Kanban's are really easy to visualize if you have like, let's say like 20 products in the pipeline that you can see them all being moved from like left to right. Like, you know, maybe in the left, it's like, okay, this, this uh, it's being like assigned to this sourcer. Like, oh, okay, like we're at pricing. Now it's like, you know, the product development teams like review and Got then it. like placed in order. So you kind of so, see. It. Yeah, so it's kind of like Trello, right? But I guess more advanced with more features. Exactly. Okay. And yeah. you also have like a sauna functionality too. So like you have like normal tasks. So I can press up both a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And there's, yeah, there's like really easy to use like templates so that like every time we launch a new product, it's yeah. all like kind of like duplicated and we have like project managers that kind of follow up with like all the timelines. So like, okay, photography needs to be done here. Like, you know, EBC needs to be done here. Like, yeah. and it just kind of all works together. That makes sense. So for those of you guys watching right now, a couple more people hopped on. What kind of project management tools are you guys using right now? I know when I first started out, I was using Trello. And then that wasn't, I guess, as powerful enough for me and the functionality I needed. So I use like Asana and Basecamp right now, but for like two different, uh, depending on like what like projects I want and where. Uh, but you're using GetFlow now, which is, right. is that the one? Yeah, GetFlow combines Asana and Trello. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty right. cool. Okay. And then, but I did notice like in the comments, a lot of people said uh, they don't have VAs right now. So I guess a question that for the audience uh, to speak on behalf of the audience, if they don't have zero employees, like when do you kind of like forecast that you need an employee? Like when, when should someone start thinking about like, oh, I need to hire someone? Is it before they even quit their job? Is it before they even go on Amazon full time? Um, like what's your opinion on it, Fernando? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
I mean, I think it just like de- like really depends on your like situation and how much time you're spending doing stuff that is not really helping you grow your business. You know what I mean? If you're spending like an hour a day doing customer support, like to me, I would, you know, like, we can hire like a support person maybe for like three, four dollars an hour. But maybe like what you do is you're like, okay, you know what? I'm going to pay somebody like really part time. It's going to be five dollars an hour. So like. $20, uh, you know, $20 a week. And even if you're making like, let's say a thousand dollars in profit a month, like it's probably worth it to me to pay $20 a week, you know, $80 a month. Um, something like give or take like that, uh, to, to take care of a support and, um, and maybe some administrative stuff like, you know, filing cases with Amazon and like responding <clears throat> to random inquiries. And like, you know, it, it, it just saves you time so that you can focus on like the bigger picture stuff, you know, like building a better relationship with your manufacturer or mm-hmm. uh, negotiating your pricing or finding new products to source, like all that kind of stuff that like really helps you build your company. Cause if you spend all this time, you know, focused on like kind of the lo- lower ROI stuff, honestly, mm-hmm. it's like, it's tiring, but two, it's just not like the best use of your time. And so like we found that like we, we like to hire a head. So like, you know, even if we don't need this person for like the next 30 days, we'd rather like bring them in, get them like, you know, cause it takes at least a few weeks to hire them than like get them trained. And then by the time that we actually like need them, they're like ready to go and they can be working on other stuff in the meantime. All right. Two. So I totally agree with that. So for those of you guys watching, basically the gist of it from what Fernando was saying is don't get stuck working in the operations of your business, right? Don't get stuck into the day to day grind of everything, right? You want to be working on the steps that are going to move your business forward, essentially. Did I get that right for now? Yeah. Yeah, So like, yeah. And like, that's even more important, especially when you're in the beginning of your journey, right? Especially if you're balancing that and the full-time job, Right, because if you're balancing your full time job and you're just working in the operations of your business, then it's going to take you. It's going. You need to find time in your day somewhere to find and focus on those um, activities that are going to grow your business. Right, because if you just fill up your day with you know like working on your job and then working in the operations of your Amazon business, then that only gives you a little bit of time to actually and energy. Right, your energy is going to be drained to like want to like work towards building your business right do you guys agree with that like yeah let me know in the comments so but yeah that totally makes sense or anything um in terms of hannah said if we could we get end up getting into q4 uh hannah asks if we start the course tomorrow and follow along would we end up getting into q4 um that's funny uh hannah congrats on buying the pre-sale of the course and everything but yes if you started now you definitely would get your items in by q4 unless you know your items had like a six week like lead time or so so it just really depends on how fast you move and how fast the manufacturing times are how fast the lead times are um and as long as no problems occur but yeah for the most part yeah you would and yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I would say just to jump in, like I would say like Q4, like a most like unless you have like a Halloween product, like I would say most of Q4 picks up in kind of like the week of Black Friday. So even like so like, yeah, I would really be shooting for like kind of mid November and then maybe a few weeks before that to get like reviews and like kind of get the product launch. But yeah, you'll have more than enough time. Yeah. Like to, to get through the course and um, to, like, to like launch your product for sure. Okay, cool. I just want to say a quick shout out to Melvin. He uh he stopped watching Donald Trump and Kim Jong Un to watch us instead. So I hope we're more entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, hope we're more entertaining than That's that. So, funny. Uh, so if World War Three happens, don't blame it on me. All right. So, <laughs> blame it on <laughs> anything. But yeah, let's just jump back to like scaling and team building, right? So you know, looking back on everything, because I think most people here are you know thinking about getting their first hires you were saying a little bit earlier that maybe your first hire should be like people that get you out of the operational tasks right so in tasks in general that people should outsource right away like if you can just name some off the top of your head like for me like like you just to repeat what you're saying is just customer service right maybe managing some what okay customer service uh anything with seller central maybe like Yep. Little things like updating images, um, any tedious tasks 
those are the things you want to be like outsourcing. And then also you said like reimbursing like cases, right? Okay. Right. So for like all of those, like those are definitely like easy things that we cover within the private label MBA course of like, you know, the first things you should outsource to the VAs, but is there anything else that we kind of should like advise people to really outsource to that they might not be thinking about? Um, yeah, I mean, you could be having them like track like your metrics. I think that's like a big one. So like seeing how your conversion rates are changing over time, how your sessions are changing over time. Um, I would say, yeah, your BSR, of course, which is like definitely one of the biggest ones. Um, yeah. What other like big ones would I like outsource right in the beginning? Yeah. Like maybe like helping keep like a spreadsheet like updated for your like weekly sales so that you have like inventory planning so you kind of know when to start to reordering i would say probably like like almost like as soon as you can like hiring like a really smart person and then like just increasing their hours if you have like let's say zero like like you know zero uh zero employees right now like one of the things i would maybe do is consider like okay if i got a, like maybe i have like two thousand dollars in profit a month Maybe I'll hire somebody at like three hundred dollars an hour. They've got experience from an Amazon company. <laughs> three hundred a month. <laughs> yeah, and like maybe yeah, it's like okay. part time, you know, like <laughs> okay, like yeah. and it's like okay, you know, they they know how to do the reimbursements. Like they've done support like really well. And you're like, look, I, all I'm expecting is like fifteen hours a week or twenty hours a week, and then I just don't want to like touch this. And then you know, uh, all that kind of stuff goes to them. If there's anything really important that, you know, comes into your, let's say your customer support email, they forward it to your personal email or to your other like work email. And then you kind of, um, that way you're only seeing like a small, small percentage of those emails. And that allows you to really focus on like the bigger picture stuff. I forget who, who said it, but like, I remember like hearing this like interesting story about like Steve jobs and you know how he's like really famous for his like, uh, is uh, black turtleneck, right? And so, yeah. like, the, you know, like all these like really famous like CEOs of tech companies are like always wear like kind of the same thing. And mm-hmm. supposedly, it's because uh, you only get like so many like decisions that you can make in a day, right? And so, by like choosing like what you have for breakfast or what you're gonna wear that day, you're kind of wasting like kind of decision making power. And even if you don't think like, oh yeah, like, well, I, like, it's not, it's super easy for me. Like these guys really took it to an extreme and just wear the exact same thing every single day. So it's not something that you have to like think about and it allows you to like use all of your, like, I guess like brain resources towards like the really important things. And I feel like customer support, administrative stuff, filing cases that like all fits in like perfectly uh, into like why you should not like not be handling uh-huh. that. Yeah, guys. So, <laughs> so should we wear the same thing every day? I think that's the big takeaway Fernando yeah. was trying to tell us. No, but that makes sense. So when it comes to decision making, right? And like I think everyone has a certain amount of like energy available to them every day, right? And part of the energy uh, that drains you is like decision making. So it's interesting that like Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, he always right. wears a jacket. Steve Jobs always wears a black turtleneck, neck, and certain right. people do that. And it does make sense. Like for me, like I don't take it to that extreme, but I right. usually keep my breakfast to the, like the same thing every day. So I know like I'm going to eat oatmeal uh, and maybe a protein shake in the morning. And that's like my breakfast. And I don't really like to think about like, hmm, do I want uh, kolaches today? Oh, oh, wait, you guys don't have kolaches in California. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, but like, do I want donuts today or do I want something like else, you know? So that's like what I do in my business, but I'm curious, like if anyone else like eliminates, like for those of you guys watching, do you guys like eliminate like any decisions like in your day, similar to like, you know, the food you eat, the clothes you wear, or like, just like you guys have certain routines, right? I think that's why like routines are really important because in a way routines just kind of, you, you know, what's going to happen. So you don't have to waste energy being like, okay, like, Okay, it's like I got planning things like all the time and not knowing where to shift your time at, at the right time. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's like a big reason. Like, I mean, you know this because like, you know, we lived together for a while. But like, yeah, I signed <laughs> up for this like this meal yeah. plan, and so like the, for you, for those of you guys that have like some profit and you're like you know looking for ways to save time, honestly, the best life hack uh, that I think uh-huh. like, for me in the last few years has been like ordering a meal plan. And it can be paleo, keto, whatever you want, like athletic size. But like, I mean, this has been like honestly a huge like 
time save because yeah i don't have to think about like what restaurant to go to i don't have to like worry about going to the grocery store i don't have to worry about cooking i don't have to like worry about cleaning like and it's a write-off if you put it as you know office meals or whatever but yeah i mean it's honestly (laughs) like you know that's to be determined by your tax account but like honestly best hack I've ever done like in terms it just saves me countless hours every like week and I can like work through lunch get like more stuff done and then like yeah I just justify it by like working an extra like whatever 30 minutes like at the end of the day uh or even like the time that I spent during lunch and it easily pays for itself um and yeah so it's one last thing I have to worry about okay yeah and I totally agree with that um so if you guys didn't know, if you guys watching, I was living with Fernando for like the past like five, four months um, earlier this year. And um, it was a great time. And I was always getting meal plans because there was no cooking. I don't think, uh, okay, <laughs> me and Fernando for five months, we never cooked once, right? The only thing, oh, okay, wait, we did cook. The only thing that was ever cooked was ramen, uh, mee goreng, uh, dry instant noodles. I don't know if you had that. It's super good. But that was the yeah. only thing that was ever cooked. That was like at 3 a.m. <laughs> there's, there's no like daytime cooking. Yeah, that was at 3 a.m. But uh, Ray has an uh, interesting pro tip. Ray says, skip breakfast altogether and do intermediate fasting. Saves about 30% of meal decisions, which is true, and plus saves money, right? I like so that. I heard um, IF like really works for some people. I never really tried it. I guess like I'll do it accidentally because if I skip breakfast. But um, yeah, I hear that it works great for some people. If you guys don't know what IF is, it's like basically you only eat for like – I think, Ray, is it you only eat within like an eight-hour window or something? Is that right? I don't know. Yeah, Correct me if I'm wrong. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like 12 to 8 or like 11 to 7 kind of thing. You can like – your window can change. Um, yeah. And then yeah. Sean says he doesn't cook either. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. So, so all, all of us like, you know, number one supporters of meal plans right here. Yeah. Actually, I do intermittent fasting too. So, like, yeah, that's a great tip. Yeah, I, I love it. I think it's it's really saved me a ton of time. And allows me to like focus a little bit more in the mornings. Okay, cool. And then um, just going back to the topic of just I guess like scaling to the eight figures, right? So besides like you know having the right team, do you think um, maybe like certain decisions you made, wh- whether it's like financial metrics that you held yourself accountable to, or things like that, allowed you to grow faster than maybe other people? Um, certain like business decisions you made. Um, yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I think, um, so yeah, we like, and we didn't, I think we felt like, um, uh, I think everyone kind of in the Amazon space, uh, and I mean, pretty much any like an entrepreneurial, like kind of startup community really focuses like on top line revenue, or I guess in tech, it's like user growth too, but like, it's almost like all about revenue, revenue, revenue. And I, I think, uh, we've definitely felt to that. Like, I think once we started like really shifting, more to like profit and like EBITDA numbers, which is like earnings before interest tax depreciation, all that kind of stuff. I think that like really shifted our mindset to like what really mattered. I think aligning our team towards those goals also really helped. I know like a lot of sellers I've seen like really hold those like numbers really close to their chest. They never like talk about revenue or profit with their teams. I think that's fine. But I think that also kind of limits your your team's ability to like make important decisions that's going to help your profitability because they're kind of like working in the dark, I guess you would say. But yeah, I mean, I would say like, uh, yeah, kind of aligning the goal of the, everyone's goals towards EBITDA and really putting in like strong financial incentives. So it could be like yeah. a month's salary or two so months. Real salary. quick, for, for those of the people who don't know what EBITDA is, can you explain just what that term is? Uh, yeah, so I know yeah. it's like an important business term, but I have a feeling that not everyone knows what that is. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if you're looking at your like income statement, uh, so I'm going to go with uh, my little, my hand gestures again. So <laughs> super helpful. So if you have like uh-huh. revenue up here on your income statement, and then as you move down, you have like all your costs. So that's everything from uh, your cost of good landed for your product, your freight, your FBA fees, your referral fees all that kind of stuff. And then you kind of get to your gross margin. Then you're going to have all of your, below your gross margins, you're going to have all your OPEX. So that's your advertising expense, your office, cars, office meals, salaries, like all that kind of stuff. And then you're going to get to your earnings before interest tax and depreciation. So that's your EBITDA. And so like a lot of the time when you're focused on like building a company to sell, 
you're going to get a, a multiple on your EBITDA or like your seller's discretionary earnings, which is kind of like uh, EBITDA plus some like ad backs for like kind of one-time expenses. Uh, but yeah, EBITDA is like the most like important metric probably for like an e-commerce company because it's kind of basically your profit at the end of the year. Mm, got it. Got it. Okay. Well, that clears it up um, real quick. Uh, Will Henderson, uh, I believe Will, you're from Dallas, right? So shout out to another fellow Texan. But uh, Will asks, us, can you guys recommend a bookkeeping service that I can hire that's familiar with Amazon? It is a time killer. So off the bat, I'm biased, but I have a accountant out of Houston, um, another Texas guy. He was one of my fraternity brothers. He handles my accounting stuff, and you can find his information within the crafting guide. So just check the pin post, uh, Will, and you should be able to – contact him uh, fernando you have any recommendations on that or yeah we just switched uh bookkeeping firms actually and so it's too early to tell um uh, but yeah i will if you want to pm me um and follow with me like in like 30 days i will tell you if it worked <laughs> out but yeah I'm, like he came recommended so i'm like pretty excited about it um but yeah i'm still we're still like in kind of in that transitionary mode uh where we're bringing more stuff like internally like we uh like anything knows this but we just hired like a finance manager and like a financial analyst like onto like our internal teams like full time so they're like all kind of like revamping all of our books and all that kind of stuff right now okay cool perfect perfect um so 30 days someone in the chat uh, will someone volunteer to remind Fernando in 30 days to report back? <laughs> 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 someone set a calendar reminder. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Jason asked, what if I'm from Australia? Then I would actually I would just make a post about it within a solar tradecraft group. Uh, there's a couple of Australians within the group, but I totally. would probably ask, you know, someone local to Australia to help you out with that, Jason. Um, but yeah, okay. So in terms of questions, growing, scaling to the eight figure level, did you did you ever think you were going to grow as fast as you, you know, like is it was this all planned? Was this expected? Or you know, like, or from the first month you were like, all right, in two years we're going to hit the eight figure mark, or like in whatever, like was that the plan, or like how did it happen? Oh, definitely not. Actually, I remember Nick and I got in like an argument, like right in the beginning, uh, based <laughs> on like what we thought our goals were going to be. And I mean, we were both super wrong and had no idea. But I remember, um, I remember, yeah. So we were listening to like interviews and podcasts, and then like we hired our first coach, which was super super helpful. And then so I was like, okay, we need like a goal, like we need like uh, to kind of shoot for something um, for like the month of December. And then Nick's like, okay, like, what do you think? And then I was like, um, I think 500 grand. And he's like, where the hell did 500 grand come from? And I was like, well, like, you know, I heard about this guy that did like 400 grand in his like ninth month. And well, there's two of us and we have one extra month or something like that. Like, or, or maybe it was like, <laughs> we have two of us, we have one extra month and we're probably better than him. So like, we can just do it like an extra hundred grand. He's like, that's, the worst idea. Uh, and so, then, you guys were, so the goal was to shoot for a nine hundred grand within how long? Oh no! So, so it's five. Oh, like, so it's supposed to be five hundred grand in the month of December uh, of twenty fifteen. Oh, okay, got it. And got then it. he was like, "That's like really unrealistic." He's like, "Let's do hundred grand." And I was like, "Oh, but that's like so low." Like, I mean, like, there's all these guys <laughs> doing like three hundred. Like, we need to like. We I do we come from tech startups, like we for sure can do this. And then so it was like an agree to disagree kind of thing. Like we so, we, so he was like, all right, well my he's like, my internal goal is a hundred, my goal, and then my goal was five hundred. We ended up doing a million. <laughs> so so we were both like really, really far off. December yeah. 2015. Yeah, we did a million. Jesus. Yeah, so it was crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously not like gonna happen to like uh everyone's like we were really, really fortunate. Uh, but yeah, it was just like really funny, like how it all like worked out. Like we were way off. I think it was one point one, actually. Yeah. Um, oh man. Yeah, that's so insane. It was, yeah, it was ridiculous. <laughs> so one point one, and then so so would you say like I guess oh for I guess I guess another question I want to ask like you guys watching right now are you guys uh do you guys have partners like you guys in the audience like do you guys have partners in your businesses are you guys going through this alone i know some of you guys said you guys don't have any vas at all so it's just like curious like 
do you guys are you guys working with anyone or do you guys partner up with anyone because yeah yeah but yeah in the meantime while we figured that out um i know for me like i don't have a partner and then like seeing fernando and nick have like a partnership it's really cool to see um but it's not something like you always see um and it's weird seeing like hearing like all the horror stories so i guess for you guys getting into the business like how did you guys not fall into the traps you know um of like becoming a horror story oh man i mean well we always said like and i mean i think it still really like holds true is that like you know the um, like our friendship was more important like than the business and i think like we really like committed to that you know what i mean like we'd have like disagreements or whatever but like we knew like fundamentally like uh we were both doing what we thought was like best for like the business and like i think you know our friendship goes back like so far like you know uh what is it like 11 years now so like i mean we know that like uh we both like fundamentally you know trust each other and so that like even though we might have like a disagreement like we're we're doing what we think is like best and like honestly like our our fates are kind of like tied together right because we have like the same bank accounts the same <laughs> business like same same everything so like if one of us fucks up like or screws up uh you know it affects both of us and so i mean i think like when you really have like a lot of trust and like you know like our relationship with you you know you lived we lived with you for like for so long like there's just so much like trust there and i feel like um you know when when you have that kind of trust then like um it just allows you to like try to like take a step back and be like okay like you know where are they coming from like you know we, like you have this like kind of given that like we're both trying to do what's best for the business and so it, it allows you to kind of be i guess more like emotionally intelligent like trying to like understand like okay well i feel like he's he's worried about this so like like is there like a compromise kind of stuff like that okay yeah um, you brought up a really good point i remember like for some reason uh and Esther brought this up too. Um, I, there's always this thing, you know, everyone knows what IQ is, right? Yeah. But in terms of like another metric that's really important in life is, was it EQ? Yeah, EQ. EQ. Yeah. Okay, yeah, totally. EQ, right? So emotional intelligence. And this was something I didn't realize was like a, a what do you, do you, do you call it a metric or like, like yeah, what is it? Yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah, like an yeah, emotional quotient. Yeah, I, w- I would call it like a, yeah, a metric. Yeah, and I think that's like something that will apply to you when you like even talk to your suppliers, right? So, any like whoever is on your team, right? Because getting to the eight figure mark by yourself is going to be very, very tough to do all alone. Um, I'm sure it's doable. I just haven't met anyone that's ever done it. So, <laughs> anyone who's at that level that's done it alone, I'm sure like um i don't know maybe has a really good product or like got really lucky somehow but anyone that i personally know that's gotten to that far like in business like has a team right and part of building that team is having that emotional intelligence right you can be the smartest guy but if you don't really understand like how everyone else on your team is feeling and how you can cater to their needs and understanding what their goals are right then it's gonna uh it could hold you back in business and that's like you know, one of the things that I learned, like watching you guys work, you know, from a day to day interaction within your office, because I know for some of us, like uh, some of the viewers, like in this room, <clears throat> you guys might probably feel like you guys are going through this alone. Right. And that's how I felt in this business a little bit, you know, just because like you work at home. Uh, it's cool that you can work from anywhere. Right. But generally yeah. you, you work from home and then it gets lonely. And when you get lonely, then you just kind of, I don't forget to like socialize with people, but, or maybe your friends are just the people over Facebook and everything. But that's the good thing about having like the Facebook communities and like just interacting with other people in person whenever you get the chance at like co working spaces, at like local Amazon meetups, uh, which I highly encourage like you guys do both um, from time right. to time just to really get yourself out there. And like, cause I remember at one point I felt like I forgot like how to socialize. Uh, <laughs> at first, I didn't see like, any of my friends for like three weeks, like I was just on repeat of like wake up, eat, gym, work. And then that was it for like three weeks. And then I went out and I was like, okay, like how do I do this again? What do I tell people I've been up to? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, but things like that. Yeah. Um, and so just real quick, uh, Will asks is, Fernando, when you were forecasting sales for December of 2015, did you 4X more inventory or more like how like how do you for that was like your was that your first q4 or yeah it was our first q4 yeah yeah yeah. okay 
Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think what we did, and we were so far off, but like, I think we took like our, I want to say our September numbers. We anticipated that we would double it for November and then we would double November for December which I don't think was like very, very accurate for us. Um, I think, it, uh, honestly, I think a big part of it is whether your products are giftable or not. So like if you're giftable, yeah, a 4X is, is probably very doable. But for us, like, because most of our products are not like super, super giftable, um, I would say it was probably usually like around two to two and a half times, um, like our normal sales, um, sometimes up to three times. But like, it's really for us, like kind of around November 20th, all the way to like kind of December 20th or so. So like for that, like 30 day period um, until like your products are not prime eligible, like before Christmas is kind of when it starts slowing down for us. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. And then for me, well, I, I think my December 15 was my first oh it was my second q4 but first q4 for private label so i knew it like there was going to be a huge sales surge and i think i ordered 3x my inventory but in reality i should have ordered 4x but it is dependent on um you know like the categories you sell in like for at that time like my hot items was like in toys so um that's why it was just like it did that but like say you sell you know seasonal summer item like pool floaties i mean sure you're probably gonna see an increase in sales but you might not see it as dramatically as like a giftable item right um so it just really depends on the situation so yeah uh depends on what items you are and all that so hope that answers your question well cool uh jason lang langham langhamton jason langhamton asks is with so much at stake scaling to eight figures, do you start considering things such as account suspension, insurance, and other things? So do you yeah, do you have account suspension insurance, first of no. all? Okay. That's that's okay. interesting. So I just like, yeah, I was hearing about this recently from someone that was considering it. Mm -hmm. Um I think for us, yeah, I I I think it's really interesting. Um but yeah, I feel like uh, that's just not something that we're like we're really interested in, in doing right now. Okay. In terms of, I guess, other insurances, you guys have, I assumed, uh, normal personal uh, the liability, business liability. Yeah. Uh, one. Is there anything else that maybe people should consider? Or uh, yeah, I mean, so we have product liability, um, and so that's like a big one. Like, if you want to sell like on Walmart. Um, Amazon requires it, but they don't actually check for it. So like kind of up to you. And then, yeah, truthfully, like we, we ended up buying it when we started selling like sex toys because we were worried about the liability. Uh, so that's <laughs> when we were like, okay, yeah, like, this is probably a good idea. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, probably a good idea. Yeah. So we're like, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I won't go too far in that. Um, but yeah. So yeah, that's a, I think when we like really were like, okay, yeah, we should probably buy this. Um, but yeah, as we've like uh, built out like our retail team and started to like open like um, bigger like retail accounts, a lot of them do verify. So like that was like a big thing for sorry product uh, insurance. We have like workers comp and general liability. Yeah, a bunch of that stuff. I really like hate paying attention to. But yeah, we do not do account suspension though right now. But it is like it is really interesting. Yeah, it, it's like it's a very very unique business model for sure. Okay. Cool. David Cha Cha. I feel like your name looks really familiar, David. I don't know if I've seen it somewhere. I don't know. It's, it's not everyone has a last name Cha Cha, but David Cha Cha asks, is, do you guys sell outside the US and when is it a good time to expand? <laughs> Ray, Ray says sex toys, that's ballsies. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very yeah, ballsy. Uh, yeah, you should see what's behind the wall, uh, behind Fernando. But uh, <laughs> uh, David, yeah, David. Um, you guys sell outside of the U.S. and when is it a good time to expand? So um, I personally do sell outside of the U.S. I expanded after a year just because I was curious on like what the sales are. And the way I saw it was Amazon's only getting bigger. It's less competitive in all the other countries. And everyone always wishes they started yesterday, right? So I was like, let me get my foot in the door. Let me plant my flag. Let me plant my brand over there and – you know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, then I just have a lot of annoying paperwork to deal with, uh, which does happen. Uh, Europe is pretty annoying. Um, 
especially with like that and everything. And then like if you go into other countries, Canada, Japan, uh, Mexico, uh, it can get more confusing. And then now there's what India and Australia too, and yeah. so there's all these different uh, laws, and it gets confusing. Um, if especially if you don't have an accountant or, or like a service that you go through. For me, for Europe, I went through a company called Simply Fat, um, and they're helping me out. So I'm like having an okay time with them. It could be better. Uh, there's some issues, uh, but yeah. So I expanded over Europe, but like sales were just I don't know. Would say like when you do the math, it's like maybe ten percent of like the U.S. Like for all the internationals combined for me uh personally so maybe i'm doing it wrong uh maybe i'm not paying attention enough to it uh because that does happen because it's like a separate drop down right so you have to like physically go to the other ones go from uh dot com to uk to germany to italy to france and all those to really check um but yeah that's my experience with it david uh fernando what about you uh yeah so we did it like pretty early i think we did it maybe month six or seven uh so we did canada and the uk uh and then with that like all of the eu all at the same time so it was like pretty intense but like yeah i mean uh i think we did really well like overall we probably did maybe two million last year between canada uk and eu but honestly we realized that like our for us like in our categories our bottom line um wasn't as high um, especially when you like factor in VAT and then like for us, like we just didn't have the economies of scale because we were kind of doing it like, piecemeal. It's like, oh, well, we have some extra inventory. Why don't we just like test it in the UK or, you know, test it, uh, you know, in Canada. And, um, and what happened was like, you know, if we'll say we're sending like 5,000 units to the US. So like, you know, you get like economies of scale and freight, but if we're only doing like 500 units, um, to the UK, for instance, then like your per unit cost is going to be a lot more expensive. And then on top of that, like, you know, you have that. So like our margins just weren't there. But I think if you, if you really focus on it or you're really trying to build like a a big brand, like then I think it totally makes sense to kind of like Anthony's strategy of kind of planting your flag, being there like kind of early to market and then having that brand recognition um, but for us, cause we're just kind of, um, we're just like constantly launching products. Um, we decided to focus on, uh, us and Canada and Canada specifically, cause we have like a really amazing like account manager, uh, versus like UK. We didn't have that, even though we did like quite a bit of revenue and, um, yeah, it's just like the margins like weren't there that we decided to focus. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, David, so it just really depends on you, but. If anything, like when it comes to like the 80 20 rule, I think Fernando agrees with me when I say this is to just focus on the US, focus on where the money is coming in first, focus on where it is easiest before you like really expand outwards. Um, Because it's when you expand outwards, it comes with a whole new set of like headaches, Um, especially like maybe customer support in a different language, different tax laws, different tariffs, things like that. So, uh, one thing at a time. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, my my suggestion would be like once you can hire somebody, maybe to focus on it, you know, and like it could be someone that's like, you know, again, like cheaper, someone like overseas. But if you can hire someone that's going to de- be dedicated towards it and you're willing to put in resources towards it, then do it. But like if you're splitting your time on it, then I wouldn't do it. OK, cool. And then real quick, before we answer uh, Melvin's question, Fernando, do you want to tell people about the webinar tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Having? Yeah, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm yeah. super excited. Uh, it's our first <laughs> webinar. So yeah, Anthony is going to be going through like, um, yeah, like I mean, it's it's covering like kind of like our three like uh, big secrets. It's kind of like hacks that you know now combined between like Nick, uh, Anthony, and I, we've got about like ten years like of experience on Amazon, and so like a lot of people were asking like kind of what are your biggest takeaways or your biggest hacks. And so Anthony's going to be kind of covering through like kind of what we've like kind of whittled down as like the three like best hacks that we've figured out over the years. And then he's going to be covering it in like a pretty like in-depth webinar tomorrow. And I have no idea what time it's at, but uh, <laughs> what time is it at? <laughs> I'm not exactly sure, but I will post the, <laughs> the link. How do I post? Hey, can I comment in here? I don't know if I can comment in here. I know I can make certain comments pop up, but um I'll go ahead and post. I can make this pop up, but I don't know how to put it inside the 
Wait, did it pop up on the screen? It's not there yet. Uh, one second. Let's see. Oh, no, it broke. Okay, yeah. so basically, uh, <laughs> here, Fern, I'll send you the link, and then you can just post it in the comments if anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, just to, so you guys know, like, so up until this point, tomorrow, uh, we're having the pre-sale for the private label MBA course, and this is the thing and uh, that me, Nick, and Fernando have been working on for the last six months, okay? And it's why I moved, you know, went to California for five months, you know, stayed with Fernando, like, learned the inside and outs of um, Amazon FBA from their business, right, from their perspective. First, you know, one, for selfish reasons to learn more for myself, but two, to really build a better course, right? Because originally I was going to do this alone, but then I realized I was like, okay, well, I'm going to help other people, but how do I lay the foundation so people can like even grow, surpass me, right? Because so that's why I look to Nick and Fernando and like, yeah, like my mindset on a lot of things have like simply changed just because of like the little, little tips, right? Like one of the biggest things that I realized that I need to do right now is shift from having part-time employees to full-time employees, right? Because a part-time employee is going to have their focus divided between two different um, companies, right? Two different employers. And I realized that, you know, if your, you know, your team members overseas or virtual assistants are doing that, right? Eventually, when you first start out, it's perfectly fine, right? Because you're hiring people hourly. But when you start growing bigger and bigger, you want people to come with you on the journey, on a vision. And like, that was just a simple tip and trick that maybe some of you guys already knew but little things like that just came up all the time little things and big things like that came up all the time when i was hanging out with fernando and nick and we put that all into like the best course uh, that i've ever seen i've seen all the other courses out there and like this one ours just blows it out of the water um but yeah tomorrow we're having a webinar over like the three big main like mind shifts that i've had uh during my journey with fernando and nick too um, and then for now, I'm going to go ahead and post the link to that in the comments below. But yeah, you guys should definitely join us on that webinar. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and it's going to be our celebration of the basically the launch of our private label course. So I'm super excited for that. We've been doing this like in the works forever um, and all of that. So yeah, if you guys are interested, like let, let us know and we're going to post it in the comments below. But in the meantime, we'll jump into some of the other questions before we wrap everything up on this call. All right, so uh, Melvin says, do you guys not worry about the Trump increased tariff for China import tax? Um, how do you feel about that, <laughs> Fernando? Like, I personally, I don't know. I like I keep hearing about it, but I don't, I'm not doing anything until I guess like it actually happens, I feel like. because. Yeah. I know he's putting up taxes and then other countries are putting up taxes too because so it's just like a battle against each other that we're all going on. And I really don't know if like do t tariffs like instantly like work right away or I have no clue really how that works until it really does affect me or until my supplier says something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. I mean, I, here's the way I look at it. It's like, uh, you know, I only worry about the things that I can like immediately control, um, because there's like a million things that I could worry about, you know, like tariffs, uh, you know, like uh, account suspension, like, I don't know, my <laughs> yeah. supplier coming in and competing with me, like, and so I think it's important to be like aware of it and then kind of hedge your, and start creating kind of like safeguards in your business so that like, that's not like you're not going to be completely vulnerable, but I I don't think yeah to me like I wouldn't I I wouldn't worry about like spending too much time like worrying about it uh, because I mean hopefully like what happens is like the best case is if that were to happen then you know everyone kind of raises their prices accordingly and then like it doesn't really change anything. The worst case is that people don't pay attention and then they just start like losing money. But and then like you know then what do you do is like you like you know expand to other products you know maybe with a different like uh, different material so it's taxed differently or yeah even consider bringing like some of the manufacturing back to the U.S. And I think those are all definitely doable and things that we've done so like I know that all of you guys can do it. Um, but I think you know spending a ton of energy like worrying about like things that possibly could happen isn't like necessarily like something that like I choose to spend my time um, worrying about too much. But like, that's me. Like I'm not really a worry person. Like I like to, you know, show up to the airport, like right at the last second. And like <laughs> most people hate traveling with me, uh, but that's me. <laughs> 
<laughs> Do you always make your flights? Uh, I have a really good success rate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, at, least well, that, at least ninety percent. At least ninety percent. Yeah. So you remind me of Chris. Uh, I don't think <laughs> Chris is watching this, but that was us at the airport, like on the way to Cancun. And I was like, Chris, I told you we should have left the house thirty minutes early. He's like, Nah, dude. And then I was like, Well, I had like pre-check, so I flew by and I got in. But he was like, Right. He was running. So uh, <laughs> yeah, he still made it. He was right. But um, yeah. So Will asks. When you start expanding and starting new brands, do you guys start new seller accounts? I read several times now how sellers have had their current seller account closed because they had an old abandoned account. They never closed. So now I'm cautious. All right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I can say from our perspective is that we do not. We have uh, we do have second accounts. Um, I think they're good. Uh, I guess they could, in a way, work as a, instead of account suspension insurance. Um, but I, I think that, like that kind of what Anthony was talking about, and I don't think like honestly we realize this until like you actually have multiple accounts and like different markets. But like there is this huge switching cost to having multiple accounts and like multiple markets, and like mm-hmm. like at least for us, and like I mean this is just us, like but like we focus on the biggest one. And so we spend like an important, like, like a disproportionate amount of time focused on that account because it's our biggest account. And like the smaller stuff, like kind of doesn't get like um, the appropriate amount of time. And so I think for, um, for us, like we just decided, like we want most of it to go on one account. Um, it's just simpler. But like, I guess if you had something that was like, really you don't want people to know like i don't know you have a sex toy line and like you know like a christian <laughs> brand like maybe like that's not the best to have in the same account but i think like for the for the 99 percent of like sellers that like don't have like really conflicting groups of products i think it's totally fine to have like a generic storefront name and then have like both your brands on the same account okay okay yeah i totally agree with that too so when you have two accounts, you're paying for you know two Seller Central accounts, so that's like eighty bucks a month, and then you're paying for like two Seller Legends, so that's one hundred sixty dollars you know a month. So like all your ca- costs start to double up. So for the most part, totally. most people do not need to start new Seller accounts when starting new brands. Maybe if you're thinking about selling one brand off, then it might like help to have another Seller account. But like for the most part, for most situations, most people do not need a new uh seller account and if you do decide to open a new seller account and you just forgot about the old one you had i don't know i don't think you can really forget about like oh yeah i forgot i had a seller central account uh, i don't think that like that's probably not going to happen to most people nowadays but yeah so will i would just stick with one right now until like you really get to the point where you have to like have two because then it's just going to be more inconvenient and it's going to be harder tracking sales and profits and um like all the software costs are literally going to double because you have to have two of those. So yeah, that's our opinions on the topic. Uh, uh, so we're going to answer two more questions, one from Juan and then one from Patrick, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, so Juan asks, is, do you guys have a second Amazon account uh, account for private label and what are the requirements? Uh, well, I guess this one kind of really um, repeats on what Will asked. Um, so yes, both of us, um, uh, have multiple accounts and that's just, I don't know, for me, that's, I just have a backup account. I don't really do too much sales on the second account. I just have like one private label brand on it. Uh, but that's just like my rainy day one, just in case something were ever happen. And that's how I have it set up. Um, and then similar to like for Nano too, but like I said, generally just stick with one. At first I was going to have two and like have it all separate. Then I realized how confusing it was for like my team and then myself and then just logging in and out of all of them. So it gets a little annoying. Patrick Rayo, um, Patrick Rayo, I think I said it right. Uh, which would you recommend for a first time seller? An example, lower ability to scale. So low demand, low competition niche with two or three K a profit per month with a high chance of success and the top competitor only has 30 reviews, or a high-demand product with high competition with longer periods of break-even profitability needed to gain reviews. Reviews. So, uh, yeah. I mean, off the bat, I mean, it just sounds like that first one is a lot more appealing to me. You know, so low demand, low competition, 
high su- chance of success. Top competitor only has 30 reviews. That sounds like a perfect opportunity. Um, I don't know about you, Fernando, but off the bat, yeah, I, that I mean, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I cover this a lot more in like the product selection module and stuff. But yeah, just giving those two options, a hundred percent, like number one, like, and that's like without looking at, um, you know, the quality of the competition and like the, uh, the margins of that specific product. But yeah, I mean, I think especially for like new time sellers, like, I think uh, a lot of the the like hardship of like starting the business is like placing that first PO, you know, like I've met so many people now that are like on like 12 months and counting, haven't launched a single product. I've probably consumed every freaking podcast and blog and YouTube video and everything that you can think of, but they just really can't like take that first, like, like, I mean, truthfully, like first step, which is like putting like a financial investment into your product. And I mean, I think it's honestly because there's just too much information. A lot of it's shitty, like a lot of it's good. And like, they don't really know like what to like look for in that first product. And I think because of that, like they, they kind of just like spin their, like their wheels. But like, I I think like in the beginning, you want to get like a win on the board. And like, I think if you're looking at a product that's going to have like a six month payback period, you're going to have to do like thousands of dollars of giveaways. Like, you know, are you going to really feel confident like if it doesn't rank to drop another like five grand into into giveaways to like make sure it ranks and like i feel like most first time sellers like won't do that so i would say like yeah make sure that like that you get like a win on the board and then you can start like being a little bit like riskier if you want to but yeah that's like kind of my like long answer but yeah, i would definitely do number one okay yeah totally agree with that and like just to wrap everything up um uh, Kayla, Kayla, Kala, Kala. I don't know the guy, uh, person with the mushroom icon. Um, <coughs> my little thing doesn't pop up on the screen anymore. But <coughs> she asks, oh, I, I never, yeah, I never heard of MDS. Oh, you see it? Okay, it's not popping mm-hmm. up on my screen. Okay, so she, she or he or it asks, <laughs> I've never heard of MDS Cancun except recently from higher end sellers in the Amazon FBA space. Is that a private invite? Who do you know in this space? And how did you find out about, about that conference? So yes, first of all, it is a private invite. Uh, yes, uh, only sellers that do a million dollars in sales are, uh, have access to join the group and are uh, allowed to go to the event, right? Um, it's to just keep the level of conference high. Um, that's probably why you don't see other Amazon gurus really talk about it because they don't get invited to it, uh, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> they yeah. don't. Uh, it's, it's true. true. Uh, it's true. Um, and that's why, uh, I don't know, that's just how it is. But if you do do over a million dollars in sales, that, you know, you just apply to the group. It's a thousand dollars a year. It's run by Ian and Eugene helps out too. They're both good uh, friends of ours and they're really big Amazon sellers too. And it's just really cool to be surrounded by other sellers who do like more than you or like are on the same level as you. So once you get to that point and that just, just brings me back to like, what solar tradecraft is right so solar tradecraft is a great place to start but you know like in the public community versus the private community of like what we're trying to do with the nba right we're trying to just find people who are all about the exact same mission and that's what the private label nba course is going to be about so of course the content is going to be good the real 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 most valuable thing is the continued education that you're going to get from being within a group of like-minded people um and i can't say anything better about it because like my business and my personal life has been dramatically improved since I met Fernando and Nick. Well, I met them like a year ago, but since I like really worked with them, like in the last seven months. So I assume it will happen to everyone else too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say just like add on to that, going to like an event like Cancun, like it was just like unreal because you build these like friendships, you know, you're having like margaritas and stuff and like really getting to know like these people like on a personal level and like, I mean, for sure, like we're talking shop a lot, you know, we're talking about guys like that are moving to Puerto Rico to kind of like save taxes. And we're talking about like real inv- real estate investments and kind of like, kind of like how we're, like, we're taking some of our profits from Amazon and investing in like, in other like kind of income producing, um, you know, assets. And like, 
we're kind of like, you know, just like kind of masterminding, like just like all areas of life. Um, like actually funny enough, we like um, Nick and I did a panel on like scaling and building like there. And, but like, I feel like one of the big things is like, you can like always reach out to people afterwards. And I, I feel like that, like, like that is really what like building your, like, you know, kind of investing in your community. Like, like, you know, I mean, I, truthfully, like we're, we're bringing it back to like the course or I'm bringing it back to the course, but like, it's kind of like a shortcut into like learning from people that are like, you know, a little, like a little bit further ahead. Because if you're trying to build everything completely on your own, you're doing, you're building the business on your own. You don't have like, you know, a virtual assistant or like a team member, like to like, or even a business partner to help you. And then like, you know, it's tough. It's definitely like doable. You can do it, but it's going to take you longer than like you, if you have like someone to like reach out to like Anthony, that can be like, Oh yeah, man. Like, like, you know, changes the images really quickly or like changes in your title and you're going to rank better or like, you know, whatever it may be, but like having that like network is huge. And like, that's like what like MDS is like for us. Um, and I would love like to see like some of our students like at the like Cancun or wherever it may be, maybe Bali next year. Dude, uh, that would be cool. That's, that's our goal of ours. All right. That's, yeah. that's on our list right now. So our goal is to have our students make it to the <laughs> NBS group. That is a goal right there. That's going to be a cool goal. So Yeah. Yeah, we will. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, we should like pay for like the first one's flight there or something like that. first person yeah. to make it. I yeah, like first that. person yeah. to make it. Yeah, we should definitely do that. Okay, cool. Just a couple shout outs. Benjamin, hey, what's up? Uh, hey, ben. Benjamin. Ben is a super cool dude that's out of Singapore. So if any of you guys are watching and you guys are out of Singapore, connect with Benjamin Tan. He's out in Singapore and he crushes it on Amazon too. Um, he does really well for the guy that just started a year ago. But yeah, David Cha Cha says, Anthony, you're going to see a lot more Cha Cha a little more often. So <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just like saying your last name. Is Cha Cha really your last name? Like, I, I heard, like what origin is that? Um, you look Asian. <laughs> so very surprised that Cha Cha is like, <laughs> you're like uh, a real last name. Uh, but Vic, Vic from MDS says, hey. So shout out to MDS. Uh, Kala says, I'm aiming to be in those type of groups. Dude, you should be. Um, one of my, so besides MDS, I'm in another group called Mavericks, right? Um, it's another private mastermind. Fernando's in another group called, um, what, the Brotherhood? And he has like, his crazy people in there, you know, like these different circles that you get yourself into will kind of like elevate you to different positions, right? And I don't know, for a long time, like, I think, I don't know, it just depends on our viewpoint, really, but I don't know, like for me, like I, I always hate. Uh, so I joined a fraternity when I was in college. So did Fernando, but I hate when people say like I was paying for my friends, right? So like, but like I will tell you, like my my experiences in life financially, personally, and the amount of fun that I had and the amount of experiences that I had were all elevated because I, you know, I paid be to be surrounded by people that I wanted be to be surrounded by, right? I paid for the experience that everyone else like around me wanted to right so we were all there for like the same collaborative thing and that's what like we're trying to do with the solo tradecraft group and you know like you know like i've experienced it being an only child right i've always sought out like basically uh tribes right so from like the tennis team to like sports to like greek life to like um business like uh organizations after school you know and i think for now you feel you can feel the same way in a way yeah and like that's what it's all about so um that's where we come from uh ray asks what fraternity um are we in so i'm a sigma chi uh fern you are in two cheater yeah i couldn't <laughs> choose uh yeah i was in a business fraternity uh delta sigma pi and then i was in a social fraternity zbt yeah i'm actually having like dinner next week with uh one of my brothers uh from zbt and then actually nick is what was my little bro in dsp and that's how we met so yeah yeah that's if you're crazy. still in high school or college join a fraternity uh you can find your next business partner there <laughs> yeah i highly recommend it um it was a great experience for me um totally. but you got to choose the right ones they're all different so you know don't choose a bad one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go to the one with the best parties yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah but other than that uh we're gonna wrap things up like i said guys uh we posted in the uh comments below 
but definitely, definitely sign up for the webinar. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be awesome, and your minds are going to get blown uh, basically by the content that we have for the webinar. Um, you know, like the webinar, like I've practiced it. I've done this a couple of times at different talks, and it's always, always, we have always gotten good uh, receptive uh, feedback from it and it's we just been improving it every single time so yeah i'm really excited to like really share it publicly with the seller tradecraft group uh, and you guys are going to be the first ones to see it um so it's going to be cool yeah all right all cool. Right. so we're, we're, <laughs> ray says can we start at amazon for turning it is seller tradecraft <laughs> <laughs> all right cool so, yeah, we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna wrap tomorrow yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to wrap everything up. So we'll see you guys tomorrow. Show up for a live webinar. Later, guys. Later.